You know, we've all heard the expression, it's not only what you say, it's, it's how you say it. It's not what you say, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. Based on this saying, I'd like to propose the idea that it's not just the fact that we have the information about the gospel that's important, it's also our attitude or how we preach it that makes the real difference in our lives and in the lives of those who hear it. A good example of this is the changed attitude the apostles had after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So we pick up this story in Acts chapter four. I suppose it would be familiar if we understood uh, what is taking place in Acts chapter four, the passage that my lesson is taken from this day. Now we know in Acts chapters one, two, and three, they describe the amazing rise of the early church in Jerusalem. That's what Acts one, two, and three are about. The spectacular events where 3,000 people are baptized in a single day, the early disciples quickly forming a large group, daily meeting, eating, and worshiping together in the midst of their bewildered neighbors, who may not yet believe in Christ, but are impressed by the zeal and the joy and the closeness of this new group that's meeting in their midst. What is going on at the temple? People excited, something new. And new and greater things keep happening as the apostles of Jesus not only provide leadership and teaching for their disciples, but continue to perform miracles that draw still others into the fold. And it is at this point that the local religious leaders decide to slow things down, if not stop altogether this this religious movement that threatens to engulf the entire city, the entire nation, and in doing so, rob them of whatever power they may still be clinging to. And so, after causing a near riot by performing a miracle on the grounds of the temple, the apostles Peter and John are arrested. They're brought before their leaders who will try to intimidate them. Now their hope, was that their threats would force these men to stop this religious rebellion and thus return their city and by extension their religion to a, you know, a familiar status quo. These guys are rocking the boat. They're causing problems. We need to slow them down. We need to stop this craziness. So after a sobering night in prison, the two apostles were summoned to face the country's leaders and religious establishment. And the first question, the first question asked at this meeting reveals what, in their minds at least, this business is all about. Because it's all about power. It's all about power. So let's go to chapter four, go back to chapter four and read verses five to seven. It says, on the next day their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem and Anus, the high priest, was there and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were high, of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? I want you to notice something. Notice that they ignored the extraordinary events that had taken place at the hands of these simple men and they wanted to know who gave you the authority, who gave you the power to do what you have just done. Of course, it was a setup. In their minds, they had not ordained these crude little men to do anything. So nothing they actually did was legitimate, even if it was miraculous. Can you imagine that? Their sense of entitlement, their sense of self-importance was so great, so impenetrable, that they could not conceive of a legitimate power source that did not in some way emanate from themselves. They probably did not expect an actual answer to the question. They probably expected an excuse or perhaps some apology, a begging for mercy. This is what they were accustomed to in these rare instances when they as a council met to dispense justice and judgment 
on the poor, unfortunate enough people to violate their authority. They just asked the question. They were not expecting anybody to say anything. But Peter actually answers the question. He not only acknowledges openly that the things that they have done are true, but also offers an explanation for the power that has been manifested in him and the other apostles. So we keep reading verse eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. Note that Peter not only seizes the opportunity to proclaim Christ as the authority, Christ as the power by which he performs miracles, he also declares that even the power of the leaders before him is subject to the authority of Christ. In other words, Peter pronounces the power of those who are threatening him null and void. The leaders are impressed with Peter's confidence. And after debating what to do with them, they decide to warn these two men and just let them go. I mean, Peter continues in the same bold manner, refusing to agree to stop preaching what he has seen and what he has heard. They tell him, look, we'll let you go, but you need to stop. And Peter says, no, we won't stop. Now the council, would have dearly loved to imprison or kill these two men, but the miracle that they had performed was causing a great stir among the people, as it should. If they did anything to the apostles, it would create a worse situation which would draw the intervention of the Roman authorities. Again, it was all about power. Who wielded the power? If they killed the apostles, they might forfeit power to the Romans who would have to come in, quell the riots, and take over. If they let them go with a warning, they risked losing more power to the apostles as these people gained authority with the people. But at least with this second strategy, they could buy some time in order to see if they could stop them in perhaps some other way. That was the plan. As we read on, we see the apostles returning to their brethren who received them with great rejoicing and great prayer. This was a, a tremendous psychological victory for the young church. I mean, their most dangerous enemy was the cabal of Jewish priests and political leaders who had conspired with the Roman authorities to falsely convict and then execute Jesus, their leader and their Lord. Now, their present leaders had been spirited away in the night and brought to face the very same group, but they prevailed, they survived. They had even preached the gospel to these people. They had boldly denounced their authority and proclaimed Christ as the finally authority, and all of this, done all of this in boldness and in courage, and they lived to tell the story. The outcome was an outpouring of infectious joy and celebration and thanksgiving. And they did what Christians do when they are exceedingly glad. They prayed. Skip down chapter four, skip all the way down to verse 31. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the Bible records what must have been an incredible experience. They pray, thanking God for sparing their leaders' lives after they, had, uh, after they had the courage and the boldness to declare that Jesus is the only power that comes from God and all power is in submission to His power. I mean, that's what they said to the leaders and they proclaimed this truth to those who had the intent to kill them for saying such a thing, and yet they lived, and the church prayed, and they thanked, and they rejoiced, 
And then that power of God that the apostles spoke of to the Jewish leaders and that power of God that the church was praising and thanking, that power of God physically demonstrated itself as a reward, as a sign, as a confirmation to those who were there that their prayers and their courage was not in vain. And at that moment, very important here, at that moment, the boldness that the apostles spoke with spread to all of the people who were there. As the word says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of them began to speak the word of God with boldness, Acts 4, 31. So it's a good story, isn't it? It's an encouraging story. So where's the so what? Where's the so what here? Okay, good, I get it, so what? Where's the lesson? Well, what's interesting about this episode is that when describing the attitude that the apostles had when they began speaking to the Jewish leaders, the author uses the word confidence. In Acts chapter four, verse 13, it says, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Okay, so the author uses that word. At the end of the story, we have the disciples affected by the Holy Spirit and the Bible says they began to speak the word of God with boldness, Acts 4.31 that we just read. Now both of these are the same word. Acts 4.13, you know, they spoke with confidence before the leaders. Acts 4.31, they spoke with boldness, everyone spoke the same, the same word. The word meant freedom or confidence, or freedom to speak, or boldness. If we continue reading the following chapters, we're going to note that it is from this moment forward that the first leaders in the church appear or are raised up with power. For example, in Acts chapter 4, 32 to 36, the early church begins to take responsibility for itself and we notice that the level of giving dramatically increases with Barnabas' gift and the fact that the church begins to care for the needy and not let them you know, beg on the street, as was the custom. Why do you think there were so many beggars in the time of Jesus? Because if, if they were poor and had nothing, they were, they were out on the street and they earned their living by begging. It was the church that began to take care of these homeless people in the first century. In Acts chapter five, we read about the increased activity as the apostles' ministry of miraculous healing grew from one simple isolated case of healing you know, the, uh, of that one beggar to great crowds of sick and lame coming to Peter for healing as much as they had and they had come to Jesus. We see the apostles arrested again and this time tortured but being released miraculously from the prison as the power of Christ overwhelms the power of the leader's jails and rules. Peter even gets to preach to the leaders once again, and this time with more detail and precision about the meaning and the results of the death and resurrection of Jesus to the ones who were responsible for His death. Okay, long setup, right? Stay with me, please, long setup. The boldness, this is what I'm talking about, remember? Speaking the word of God with boldness. The boldness continues with the increased numbers of the members of the church, the selection and the deployment of those who would serve in the first office of the church as deacons and culminates with the calling of Saul and his bold mission to bring Gentiles the message of the gospel. So the point in all of this is that there was a moment in the early history of the church when the boldness of the apostles became the boldness of the church. And it was at this point when the growth of the church began to be 
as much the result of what God did through the church as what had been done through the apostles. You see, the ministry of the apostles is what jump-started the establishment of the Christian church. But what we read about in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, is actually the moment when the church became spiritually equipped to maintain and fuel its own growth, its own development. And so the question for us today in this lesson is, how do we begin to speak the word of God with boldness? We, you, me, here, Choctaw, USA, 2014. How do we begin to speak the word of God with boldness? And how do we transfer this boldness and confidence to the next generation? Because that's part of our work too. I'm happy that a lot of the sisters in the church are having babies, that's great, it's good to see all these children, but they're not only good to run around the church building, they have to be good enough to build the church when their turn comes. So how do we transfer that boldness from one to another and then from our generation to the next generation? So in closing out my lesson, I'd like to suggest several ideas in this regard. In order to speak with boldness, number one, we have to know what separates us. In order to speak with boldness, we have to know what separates us. You see, the entire product of the law of Moses was that it completely defined for the Jews why and how they were different from the other nations around them. The knowledge of this law gave them boldness to be who they were called to be despite the intense pressure and threats from the surrounding nations. They knew who they were, they knew how they were different. The early church recognized that their unique status was brought about by the incredible events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection. The apostles articulated these with their teachings and their leadership, and when the church truly embraced these things, they were given the power of separateness from the religious culture in which they had been born. Every new religion derives its power to speak by defining and redefining its uniqueness in regards to its surroundings. See what I'm saying? The early restoration, for example, the early restoration leaders, they found a voice and they found a distinct identity by separating themselves from the sterile and tradition-bound Christianity of their day. They said, let's go back to the Bible, let's get rid of these man-made traditions and so on and so forth. This was a unique voice that they found based primarily on the Bible. This separation gave them the power to speak and for nearly 200 years there were eager listeners for this message. You know, we speak with less boldness today, I believe, because we have become more like the things we separated from when we began. This weakness, this inability to speak with power continues as we are overtaken in our separateness by those who have a clearer even if it's an unbiblical message, it's clearer. Why do you think the Mormonism is growing much faster than the New Testament church? I mean, that's, that's not an opinion, folks. That's just facts. That's just facts. Why? Because their doctrine is so much more appealing? Have you ever <laughs> examined the doctrine of Mormonism? No, it's because they've been able to articulate their uniqueness and their separateness from the world in a much clearer fashion than we have. To return to boldness, we must not only rediscover and practice what separated us from all the others religiously, I believe we must also seek God to know what this generation needs to do 
in order to find its voice in the modern world. Religious pioneers like Campbell and Stone, they don't only appear once in history. We are overdue for new leaders who can articulate for the present generation why being a member of the churches of Christ matters and why it's important. If we want to speak with boldness, number two, we need to know the difference between power and empowerment. God enabled the apostles to speak with incredible power. Why? Because He empowered them to do so. He shared His exclusive power with them. I mean, think about it for a second. They were sinners, they were ignorant, they were uneducated, they were inexperienced, but what did He do? He allowed them to exercise divine power. And this experience made them bold when they spoke the word of God. You know, a church leader has two great powers. One, he can initiate a prerogative. In other words, leaders can create things, programs, missions, ministries. They can resolve issues. They can settle disputes. They can decide if the church goes this way or this way. Are we open on Wednesday or are we closed on Wednesday? With the guidance of the word and the spirit, leaders can make things happen in the church or stop other things from taking place because they have the authority to do so. But another power that a leader has is that a leader can empower the body. You know, pleading with the church or threatening the church, after 35 years of preaching, I can tell you that doesn't work real well. But empowering the church gives it the ability to be bold in speaking the word. Giving others the power and the authority to get things done, to seek new horizons, is the leader's major task. Leaders need to inspire their followers and the way this is done is by making bold decisions that challenge the status quo and demonstrate a complete faith in God. And empowering others to become leaders themselves, much like what took place here this morning. We cannot speak boldly until we're experiencing power ourselves, and we will never know power unless we are entrusted with it by those who have it. And then finally, if we're to speak the word of God with boldness, we have to know how far are we willing to go? You know, the apostles were willing to be beaten or jailed. Paul the apostle was willing to go even to the despised Gentiles. Jesus, of course, was willing to go to the cross. Knowing how far you're willing to go determines the degree of power and boldness or confidence that you have. If you're all in, if you're all in, then you have power to speak if you're all in. I mean, obviously, I don't agree with Muslim extremists, right? But you can't deny the fact that they're all in for their misguided religious ideals. They're ready to strap a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up. I mean, you know, that's insanity. But no one can question the fact that they're all in. I'm not saying that we in the churches of Christ are not willing to sacrifice, not willing to go to extremes to proclaim the gospel. I'm saying that our poor results at times, our tepid efforts may be due to the fact that we haven't sat down, whether we do it collectively or individually, and we haven't really asked ourselves the question, how far am I prepared to go for my Lord? How far exactly? It's not enough to assume what the answer to that question might be. It doesn't do us any good to simply have a kind of rough idea. We need to ask and answer, how far am I willing to go to hold on to my faith and to proclaim it to other people? Only when we ask and answer this question of ourselves as individuals and as a church, will we break through the growth barrier that we've been stalled at personally and corporately. You see, 
how far we are willing to go will largely determine how far God is able to take us. Because He doesn't take us kicking and screaming into boldness. We run towards boldness. So let's not leave here today without asking ourselves that question or else the lesson has been wasted. How far will I go to lead God's people to higher ground? How far will I go to stop sinning? How far will I go in the service to others? How far will I go when Jesus calls on me to follow Him wherever He leads? How far are you willing to go in order to experience the boldness of the Spirit in your life? You will never know until you decide how far you are willing to go. Perhaps the only distance that God is asking you to cover at this particular moment is the distance from your pew to the front of this auditorium so you can confess Christ and be properly baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, or perhaps to receive forgiveness for your unfaithfulness, or perhaps to receive prayer for your burdens, or prayer for greater courage and strength, whatever it is. Maybe the, the distance is only 30 or 40 feet, but that 40 feet will make a, distance, a difference in your life for the rest of your life. And so if you need to decide how far you're willing to go and you need to come forward this morning to prove that, then we encourage you to do so as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.